So when God gets ready to, sh to really shift something, it's because God gives a revelation to a human being and then revelation produces revolution. If what God reveals to you ultimately does not bring a revolution, it really wasn't a revelation, but it's where God is working in tandem with man that revolution comes because God begins to put a God idea in somebody who's bold enough to act in faith and in that place called obedience, in that place called there, is where everything that they need will come into manifestation. Elijah prayed for a drought, and yet he experienced God's provision. And, and, and can you imagine that this prophet had to be selfless because God used him to speak and prophesy a word of judgment saying that, listen, the land is getting ready to have a drought. Now, and I, you don't understand, biblical terms, it was called a drought or famine. In our days, it's called economic depression, a recession. Can you imagine? That's just like the Lord. If the Lord gave me a word and said, listen, God's getting ready to judge America, and uh, America's getting ready to go through a great economic depression. Well, I live in America. <laughs> that means that I'm going to be affected. That means the wonderful people of God that I pastor are going to be affected. But isn't it amazing that God will have a prophet to speak something to his own hurt? Because he had to run because they ran out of food where he was. But yet when he obeyed, if God gives you a hard word, there's a place called there. And there is a brook called Kirith that God will sustain you even during hard times. Even when everybody else is having a drought. Even when you don't understand how in the world you're going to educate your children and how you're going to keep them in programs, and how you're going to do this, and how you're going to keep your, your rent paid, or your mortgage paid, and your car note paid. There is a place called there. And I don't know whether anybody has lived long enough to watch God take you through difficult times where you didn't know where money was coming from and how you were going to be able to sustain it, and you actually look back, and you don't even realize how you made it on your little nickel and dime salary that you were making, but somehow in that place called there. I'm just telling you, there are divine provisions in the place called there. If you ever can get in that place of obedience, everything, even if you prophesy to your own hurt, there is a place called there. And this is the thing that you will realize is that purpose outlasts pain. Purpose outlasts pain. Purpose outlasts pain. When you got purpose, you can get up and work your craft even while you're hurting. You can get up and go to work and still create even with a migraine headache. Because purpose, anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, you, you couldn't afford to stop. You're hurting, but you got to still keep on moving because you realize that if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And you got to purpose outlast pain. I'm hurting, but I'm still going. I'm hurting because I got bills that's coming in, and it's going to hurt even worse if I lay here. I, I don't feel like it. I shouldn't be out of the bed right now, but purpose outlasts pain. Purpose outlasts pain. Purpose, it outlasts pain. It outlasts pain. And have you ever wondered, God, why? Why does God let things dry up? I mean, you just ask the question, why? Why? Why does God let things dry up? Why? Why, God? Why? Why can't it just be abundant all the time? Why do you have to let things dry up? I believe that God wanted to really drain some things out of Elijah. He wanted to take him to the brook Kirit, the place of cutting away. He had to prune him. He wants to teach us not to trust in his gifts, but in him. And so God put him in a position where he couldn't even save. He didn't bring them enough to where they could save it up for the week. You know, wouldn't it have been wonderful if the ravens brought him a week's worth of supply? They didn't even bring him a full day's supply at a time. They came in the morning and they had an assignment to come back that evening to bring dinner. Now, I mean, he at least could have brought the daily portion. Give us, Lord, this day our daily bread. Jesus taught us to pray that way. The daily bread, the daily sustenance of the daily needs that we need in order to survive. Give us this day our daily bread. 
But he didn't even get all of the day's portions at one time. He had, they came in the morning with breakfast, and they came in the evening with dinner. And then he drank from the brook. And so there are certain things that God wants us to just depend on him. He wants us to depend on him all of the days of our life. Notice what he says in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Except at my word. This was really a demonstration against the, the pagan god Baal. You know why? Because Baal was thought to be the, the sky god, the god of weather. He was supposed to be the god of weather. And so Elijah comes and said, okay, you all serve Baal here. There's not going to be rain. I know you, you, you're praying to Baal and making sacrifices to Baal, but there will not be any rain. You pray to your god anyway. If you think that he controls weather, watch what he does over the next three years. It won't, be, it won't be according to Baal. It'll be at my word. And not a drop of rain came because it was a defiance against Baalism. The name Elijah means Yahweh is my God. So his very name stood in defiance to King Ahab and his whole embracing of this dark culture of Baalism. And they're worshiping the God of weather. And, and it was his way of saying, I'm going to show you that your God is incapable, that he is impotent, and my God is omnipotent. He said, I'm going to show you. You think that Baal can control weather? Watch it. Make it rain. Do your rain dance. And he said, it won't be until my word. And the government, they, 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 they supported it, but yet here God let the very words that he pronounced on King Ahab, it affected him and but yet God had a place called there. And he used ravens, these big blackbirds, closely related to crows. And, and they can have some, a wingspan that reaches 50 inches. These can, these can be some interesting birds. They, they are found in, in Arctic places, to North Africa, to the Pacific, various places all over the world. And it's interesting that biologists consider them to be very intelligent birds. But they are scavengers, scavengers, scavengers. But isn't it amazing how God can bring a good word to us through an unclean vessel, a spiritually unclean one like a raven, a raven. You know, at one point, all that I knew about the raven was what came from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. But it's interesting to note that one can bring spiritual food to others and still be unclean spiritually themselves. Charles Spurgeon said this, but see too how possible it is for us to carry bread and meat to God's servants and do some good things for his church and yet be ravens still. And isn't it amazing? God used ravens. He used, used them in Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. When the floodwaters began to recede, Noah sent a raven out of the window. Why did he send a raven? Because a raven is a scavenger. And stuff that had died and was floating on top of the water, the, the raven could actually still get his meat and eat. He's a, he's a raven. He sent a raven out. He sent a raven. It's amazing. Uh, in Psalm 147, in verse 9, it says that he gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. God, God feeds the raven. God feeds the ra dirty birds, undeserving, dirty birds, but God feeds the young ravens that cry. He feeds them, the young ravens that cry. God feeds them. Jesus rem uh, 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 spoke about ravens. Luke chapter 12, verse 24. He says, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. And he says, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. He feeds the raven. God feeds the raven, and then now he uses the raven to feed Elijah. They feed Elijah. So if God cares for dirty birds, don't you think he cares for you? Don't you think he cares for you? God didn't allow Elijah to have a surplus. They had to come morning and night. They didn't bring enough on, morning, uh, on Monday to last all week, to last all month. I know Jesus taught us, give us this day our daily bread. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. And see, we would much rather 
Pray, Lord, give us this year <laughs> our annual food. <laughs> but that's not how it works. He wants to do something on a daily basis because God wants us to be dependent upon him every day. Not necessarily. I'm not saying that it's a sin if you've got a, a freezer full of food. I got a few things in my freezer, not much, but I got a few things. I'm not going to starve, I bet you that, if, I go, if tomorrow, you know, I couldn't get to the grocery store. But here's the point. There's something that you're going to need from God every day. His wisdom, his guidance, his direction. Listen, I'm going to just tell you this. I mean, you shouldn't be living hand in mouth where you literally need God to give you, a, a, you know, a ham sandwich in the morning and a tuna sandwich for dinner. Use your faith for some, to, to help bless somebody else. Use your faith to say, Lord. See, every day he says, I want you to depend on me, but I don't want to just depend for my own personal needs. How small is that? I want to be able to depend on him for the vision that he gave me. I need to depend on him for the vision. I, I need him every day, every day, every day of my life. You don't ever grow to a point where you mature and you don't need God anymore, where you learn enough and you don't need God anymore. No, no, no. You need God. If you've got children, you definitely need God. If you're married, oh my God, you need him. Every day. Because it's like, Lord, what is he going to do today? Lord, give me strength today. Sometimes that's your daily bread. Oh, what is she going to say to me today? Give me, give me, hold me, Jesus. Hold, hold me, Jesus. Let me say this to you that it's interesting that 94% of Americans say that they believe in God or a higher spiritual power. 94% say that they believe in God, but they act like atheists. And isn't it crazy we got on all of our money in God we? But what an ironic statement. What a paradox to have on money, on money. They need to say, in money we trust. <laughs> and we would put on our money in God we, in God we trust, in God we trust. May I just remind you, I want to bring you the, the balance, truth, from God's perspective. It's not always that you're flowing and overflowing in money because, you know, you ought to love God on brook days and you need to love him just as much on brook days. Your love for God shouldn't swing backward and forward whether today is a brook day or a broke day. It's like, God, I, I love you. I love you. Even if it is a broke day, I, I love you for, for when you were uh, doing my brook day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what I did have and when I could pay for others and when I could bless other folks. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you. Even when I'm struggling, I love you. Because God's, God's real will for you, I want to give it to you really simply here in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 and 9. I want you to notice this in the English Standard Version. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So God says, I, I, I want to ha really have you in, in the middle of the road. And that's where most folks are anyway, in the middle of the road. We don't want to be in a place where we are so poor that we are desperate that it makes us steal. And we don't want to have such great abundance that it makes us Say, who is the Lord? I, I don't even need you, Lord, because I can pay for it myself. I can finance my own vision. I can pay for my own doctor. So God says, I, I want to I wanna hold you in tension. I'm going to bless you with, 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 with something, but I'm going to leave some need in you. 
because I'm, I'm going to keep you humble. You know, there's some folks you don't even know how they're going to act until they, until they get something. And it, there's a total difference in the attitude of people when they get something and when they need something. And so God says, his, his psalmist is saying, give me neither poverty nor riches. Poverty nor, nor, nor riches. Don't, don't give me so much. Don't ever bless me with so much that it makes me feel like I don't need you because that's a curse. And don't strip me down, God, so low that I don't have enough to make it and, and it tempts me to steal for what I need and cheat. Deliver me, Lord, from falsehood and lying. I love the realness of God. So the Lord has plenty, plenty of ravens to supply the needs of his children. Plenty of ravens. And you'll discover that what happens by most folks, this church is, is supported by ravens. It's not by rich people that's writing big fat checks and that's what supports the ministry. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's the little bread and meat that ravens bring. Every church that I've ever visited is primarily sustained by the ravens. They're sustained by the ravens. Elijah is a type of Jesus, if you can ever get a picture of it. This is why when Jesus came, they said that before he comes, this Elijah must come again because he's prophetic of Jesus. And, and then after the brook dried up, because when you experience brook days and then go to broke days, it's time then to look for the widow woman of Zarephath. Because in the same way that he commanded the ravens, which was antithetic to their nature, to bring bread and, and, and food and meat in the, in the morning and evening, it was certainly antithetic to the nature of a widow who was doomed to poverty when she was a widow and she had no uh, pension plan or social security that she could draw from. She was destined to poverty. And here this woman was in a place, and God says, I'm not even going to give her a whole enough meal to last her for the rest of the famine another three years or three and a half years. I'm not going to do it. Uh, just tell her, fix me a cake and bring it to me. And her meal barrel will never fail. And the cruise of oil will never give out. Well, why God? Why not give her a miracle with barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels of flour and just... Uh, uh, barrels of oil. Why not give her a three-year supply up front? Have you ever thought about the fact that had the Lord blessed her with all of the meal and all of the oil for the rest of the drought, another three years roughly, do you realize that when folks in your neighborhood got stuff, other folks find out about it? Do you know that they probably would have broken into this woman's house and stolen her stuff? They could have killed her and her son. And so God says, I got a plan to bless you in a land that's dangerous, dealing with desperate people. I, I'm going to bless you in such a way where I'm not going to give it all to you at one time. I got it, but I'm going to dish it out in a way where folks around you won't know it. Because if I gave you, if I gave you your whole life savings, your whole, all of the money that you'll ever need over the course of your life at birth, most of us will be broke before we're five years old. <laughs> and so God says, I got a plan. I got a plan. I'm not going to let other envious people break in and steal your blessing. So God says, I'm going to hide it in a daily supply. I'm going to hide your blessing. I'm going to hide my divine provision. Every day, every day, girl, you're going to go in and you'll just find I got a cup of it. You, you'll scoop that cup and that I'll put another cup in. And you'll scoop a cup and there'll be another cup. And you'll scoop a cup and there'll be another cup. And you'll pour an ounce and there'll be another ounce. And you'll pour an ounce and there'll be another ounce. And you'll pour an ounce and there'll be another one. And he says, I'm going to hide the blessing. I will hide it in such a way that you'll look back and you won't even know how I was able to make it on this. And I don't understand how I was able to feed four children and didn't have but one chicken, one chicken, one. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How God will make a way out of no way. I'm just here to tell you, he will hide your blessing. A 
big blessing in something that looks really little. You don't have to have barrels and barrels. God will hide it in one, just in one, just in one. And he says, I've got more where that came from. When you need some more, I'll replenish that day by day, day by day. When that runs dry, I'll give it to you. I don't want to give you so much that you don't need me in the morning. I want you to look to me and every time that you say your grace, by thy hands, we all are fed. And mean it, mean it from the bottom of your heart. You got to get to a place in your life where you say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for another day's journey. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my strength. Jesus, thank you for helping me get my children through school. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that people didn't rob me blind. Thank you, Lord, for protecting my house. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for not letting my car break down today. Thank you. Every day, every day, I, I declare to you, there's a power, there's a blessing. Just being, whether it's a broke day or a broke day, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Jesus is worthy. I dare you to get to that place called there because some of you have been hovering around in a place that looks safe to you, that this looks like the wise thing. And sometimes when God is telling you to just launch out on me, launch out on me, launch out on me, I cannot tell you what a blessing it is just to be able to obey God. The provision of everything that you need is in the place called there. It's in the place called there. It's in the place called there. The provision of everything that you need, your healing, your deliverance, your salvation, your peace, your joy, your victory, your understanding. Oh, the idea that you're waiting on. I'm, I'm just telling you, the money, everything is in that place called there. God won't bless you until you sign your name on the line. You got to take some risk. You got to become responsible and say, Lord, I'm going for broke. I don't know what I've got, but I, I've got to trust you to go there. I got to leave this. The most difficult thing in the world for me to do was to leave the place where I came and to start Word of Faith. Because it's hard to leave out of a comfortable place. After my first year, the pastorate there, they doubled my salary. And yet God had told me, start the Word of, Word of Faith ministry. I didn't have any members, but it was a place called there. And I had to stand up to a church and announce that I was leaving when I had no place to go, when I had no members. And I resigned one Sunday, and the next Sunday I started Word of Faith. I was following a place called there. I was just going to the place called there. It was not a judgment of where I was. It was about the obedience in my heart to where God was calling me. And I'm just here to tell you that there's a place called there. I don't know who you are, but this is a prophetic church. Heaven is a prophetic, is a prophetic place. It's a prepared place for a prepared people. Slip one hand up to God right now in the name of Jesus. Is anything too hard for me? Why would you stay in a place where you've been comfortable? Is what you've experienced in your life all that you think that I am capable of doing in your life? It is but a light thing, an easy thing for me. Why let fear and trepidation hold you in the place where you are? There are things that I have prepared for you that are beyond where you can see, but go trusting, trusting. Trust my word. Trust my word to you. Trust my word to you. For I will not fail you. And the very thing that you have stressed over, I already have the provisions of that thing in the place called there. When you go, so shall it come. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.